So kia ora everybody. We're just waiting for a few more people to join. It's not quite 12 o'clock yet. expecting a few more yet so we'll give it a couple more minutes. I've got 200 odd booked to attend but I know some people book and then listen to it at a later stage so we don't always What's get What's the total to... number look like now? At the moment we've got 44 so yeah. uh, we've, I'm expecting a few more. We we'll probably get up to the 100 I would have thought, um, possibly more but uh, sometimes people as I say log in, uh, say they want it and then they can access it later. But you can access it later anyway without needing to say you want to attend because we will be recording it. We don't tend to record my chatting at the beginning. <laughs> we cut that bit out. But it's just so people don't think they, they've logged into silence or the sound's not working. All right, so I'll give it a couple more minutes just to make sure we've got everybody that's making the effort to join us. And then we'll do the introductions. Right, so welcome everybody. Welcome to this um, webinar where we're going to look at adverse events following immunization. And we're going to look at reporting and understanding um, the anaphylaxis and the reporting process. With me today, I have our guest speaker, Michael Tatley, who I'll introduce to you last. Um, and in supporting in the background, <coughs> you've got myself as host, Jane Morfitt. I'm the Clinical COVID Education Manager. We've got Gail Foley. Gail, if you want to give folks a wave. Gail's one of our COVID facilitators. And we've also got Lisa Sellers, another COVID facilitator. And Sue Rogers, one of our COVID advisors um, from the South Island. And up in my corner on my screen, I've got Jennifer Andrews, who's my IT support. Uh, go to. Um, it'll be her fault if anything doesn't work and it'll be her that sorts it out. <laughs> but she'll be hiding in the background and hopefully we won't need her. She's also an 0800 advisor and she's one of the COVID facilitators. So she's a jack of all trades. And then lastly, but most importantly, we have Dr. Michael Tatley. It's our, our pleasure to have you joining us on this webinar today. Um, and um, Michael is the uh, director of the Pharmacovigilance Soci um, Society. He's a medical advisor and he's a research associate professor at Otago University. So I'm going to start the webinar off with a little bit of background on the data that we've already seen published from MedSafe and then I'm going to pass over and Michael will do the bulk of the um, webinar and then we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions. And you'll notice um, on the bottom that our chat function has been disabled. So we like to run our webinars where you ask your questions in the Q&A button. So if you scroll along the bottom, if anyone that's not familiar with webinars, I think we're all getting a lot more familiar than we used to be. In that Q&A box, you can ask questions, either ask your questions now or wait to hear what we cover and then see if you've got any questions at the end. We will have plenty of time to respond to questions. So I'm just going to share my screen. I've got a couple of slides I want to share with you first. Um, let's put one the screen on. And there we go. So we're going to cover today um, current MedSafe data, which I will do first, which is going to be quite brief. And then uh, Dr. Michael Tatley is going to cover COVID-19 um, vaccine adverse reporting to CALM, the monitoring that's going on in New Zealand, what happens to adverse events when they go to CALM. A little Sorry, bit Jane, um, we're, look, we're seeing your presenter screen. Okay, thank you, Jen. That'll teach me. Bear with me. Let's try again. That was screen one. Let's try screen two. Is that better? Hang on. Yep. 
Is that better or is it doing the same thing again? Yep, that's better. Okay, Sorry thank you. Interrupt. Apologies for that. That's why I have Jen in the background. I should, I should know how to do this by now. Um, okay, so then we're going to look at, uh, Michael will talk about what happens when reports go through to CALM and spend a little time on anaphylaxis and hypersensitivity spectrum events. Give us a little overview of what's happening in the USA at the moment with their surveillance data and some of the common questions around what to report. And then, as I say, we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions. So what do we know so far? What's come through from MedSafe? Now, this MedSafe data comes from CALM, and it does have the disadvantage that it is only up until the 6th of March. But this is as far as they've published. And the idea is they will be publishing regular updates, but we haven't seen the April update as yet. So out of 15,130 um, doses administered, there were 147 adverse events reported, of which 144 were new ones and three were serious. There were no si uh, safety signals or potential safety signals that have been identified. And 144 of the reports were non-serious. The three that were serious related to, um, related to allergic reactions, anaphylactic uh, allergic type reactions, and they were all dealt with um, appropriately um, at the time and the patients have all made a full recovery. And so the 10 most frequently reported adverse events have been dizziness, headache, nausea, so syncope, fainting, um, and then arm pain, erythema, fever, injection site pain, and paresthesia, so numbness, tingling down arms, and increased sweating. So at that stage, I shall stop my share and hand over to Michael to share his screen. Thank you, Michael. Great, thank you, um, Jane. Thanks for that. Um, so again, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you um, all. Um, I, I obviously can't see any of the other participants in this webinar, but I'm sure that I must have spoken to at least some of you on the phone or uh, exchanged um, letters with you. I, I know many of you have been in touch with me, but it's really great to have your attention again today. Um, and again, Jane, thank you for inviting me and Use this to talk about some of the important components um, of um, COVID monitoring and the issues that are relevant to that. So what I'm going to do is share my screen now and uh, we'll go through a couple of slides that I've got. So um, hopefully that's come through okay. Is that right? Yes, that's looking good. Better okay. than mine. Excellent. Okay, good. So, um, so yes, yeah, so this, uh, Jane's already introduced that and, and Jane's gone into a bit more detail in terms of what I'm going to uh, cover, but basically a bit about reporting and talk a little bit about some of the wider components of reporting and then talk about anaphylaxis and hypersensitivity and then the reporting. So let's get into the detail of this then in the first instance. So first of all, just to put um, the center into perspective and particularly look at it from the COVID-19 perspective. So. Um, here at CALM, we're doing what we usually do, and that carries on as usual. And as many of you will know, we don't only do va uh, monitor vaccines, but we have a program which has been running now for 56 years, which does it, basically anything that's used, any product that's used in a therapeutic sense, so it's medicines, natural health products or complementary and alternative products. We now do vaping as well. We've got a particular interest in medication error. Uh, events. We have, we've had a program going and it's been resuscitated now for the purposes of this. So in particular across that whole spectrum, obviously COVID vaccine fits into the vaccine and the medication error uh, area. Um, and so we've had to rethink and retool our programs to specifically cater and cope with uh, those um, aspects. So when we look at the monitoring that we're doing for the COVID-19 vaccine, we obviously now, by this time, have a wealth of international data. I don't know what the figure is, but last time I checked, there was upwards of 300 million doses that have been administered globally across all the different types of vaccines, uh, different types of platforms that have been used. Um, and in a sense, there's no surprises because there's really been such a wealth of exposure. But of course, it's important for us to understand what the New Zealand profile is going to look like, what the pattern of events are here, 
Um, you know, we're in the utter part, uttermost part of the world. Who knows? Maybe we're slightly different from the rest. And of course, we do have a, a, a different population profile to uh, other parts of the world. And so there could be differences here. And so it is appropriate. And that's the reason we have pharmacovigilance system uh, in, I think it's about 153 countries do this sort of work. And CALM is one of those. So we look at the profile here in, uh, in New Zealand. And from that, we can pick up issues. And those are the points that I've highlighted. Uh, further on here. So we're interested in adverse events that look different, that are of interest. And in particular, we're looking for things that are new that we don't know. Yes, there's a wealth of experience, but what are those new things that nobody's observed before? Maybe there's something unique that comes up. Or maybe there are patterns of concern or interest. We're particularly interested in um, adverse events of special interest, and I'll talk a bit about those later as to what they are. But I think one of the very important components of um, the kind of work that centers like ourselves do globally for across the whole spectrum of products, whether they're medicines or vaccines, is really to reassure the public that surveillance is in place. Uh, of course, we're interested in it from a regulatory point of view, from a safety point of view, um, so that we can end up doing the right thing. But um, obviously, there will be public concern, uh, not only here in New Zealand, but of course, globally. And, and of course, we know the reasons behind that. Uh, in a compressed vaccine development time uh, time window, and these are new tech new technologies and platforms. And we have the advantage here in CALM in that we are independent of the regulatory function. University of Otago is one of the very few centers that do this kind of pharmacovigilance work that is outside of a regulator. Um, in other words, outside of a place like MedSafe or the Ministry of Health. Uh, there are only four countries, to my knowledge, uh, that are outside the regulators. So New Zealand is one, uh, the Dutch agency is another, Morocco is another, and Vietnam, surprisingly enough, is another that is outside the regulator. So that independence is actually quite valuable. So when we do all of this monitoring, uh, the purpose behind that, aside from the issues that I've highlighted, is ultimately to support the COVID vaccine immunization program, or the CVIP, as its abbreviation is given. So that's where we kind of come from and where we fit in and why we're doing what we're doing. So look, I, I apologize for what looks like a very complicated slide, but I thought it'd be worthwhile just to share this with you. So towards the end of last year, um, Nikki Turner and um, a couple of us put together a proposal as to how we thought um, we could do surveillance for uh, the COVID-19 uh, vaccine that was sought to come. Uh, for New Zealand. And a lot of this was taken out of the books or the days of the mening meningococcal vaccine, which I'm sure many of you will remember. And of course, CALM was involved in that at that time. And so we, we've taken many of the elements and all of those are still relevant today. Um, and just sort of broadly going through this image that looks very complicated on the left-hand side are sources of information about vaccine um, adverse events. On the extreme right-hand side in the top right-hand corner of abundance of committees, which I won't really go into, and they seem to change, and I don't really fully understand all of them in a, a lot of detail, but the important ones are there. And really in the middle is the COVID uh, vaccine immunization program, the CVIP, um, which is the sort of key to coordinating and dealing with the data and rolling out the program. And the program or the component of that CVIP that we are most directly uh, involved with is one of the pillars. There are eight pillars uh, in the program. So it's a very solid program supported by eight pillars. And the pillars are listed under those other pillars that I've put down there. The one we're interested in is the post-event pillar. Um, and so the data that we get from these programs are fed into that pillar for the purposes of the kind of work that we will talk about in, in just a moment. So again, just going down the left-hand side very broadly, um, what we do here in CALM in pharmacovigilance terms is called passive reporting. So in other words, there's no active component to it. It's voluntary, it's up to the reporter, whether you're public or the health professional to tell us about those events. And we call those spontaneous reports. And in situations like this, in the same way that we did with the meningococcal vaccine and we've done with the Gardasil vaccine, we try and enhance that spontaneous reporting as well by asking people to a bit, sort of relax their reporting threshold and, and maybe tell us a bit more about a new vaccine so we can get to know. And that's essentially what we're doing here. So we have a passive reporting program. Um, we're in the process of uh, looking at implementing a pilot active program for our vaccines in general. And some of you at the last IMAC meeting 
workshop that I that I attended. My goodness, it was so long ago now. Twenty was it? Twenty nineteen. Um, <clears throat> and I think previous ones we've we've seen the uh, feedback from the Ausvac safety and the Smartvacs. And uh, Nikki Turner and uh, myself have been in collaboration with those developers, and we've we've got a New Zealand version of that, which, as we speak, has just been switched on in Nikki's practice to trial out the technology. It's not uh, fully working. We just want to check that patients can actually receive. So we're, we're quite we're quite keen on um, using a system like that, and possibly we could see if we could bring it to bear for the COVID vaccine. But that's not yet active. We're interested in adverse events of special interest, and there's a whole process to um, deal with those. There's a research project going on at the moment, but uh, MedSAP has the ability to interrogate uh, background rates related to this, because obviously these adverse events of special interest are likely to be rare events. And so when they do occur, we want to know whether they stand out from the background, because if rare events are occurring, is it due to the vaccine? Are we seeing more of them, et cetera? And this is the whole point about observed, over expected, and so on. So there's a project going on with that. And, and Helen Patusis Harris is in fact leading one uh, such project. We're looking at setting up hospital surveillance programs as well. So um, although people might tell us about these events, uh, we just want uh, clinicians in the hospital that if they do come across something that they see as unusual, maybe tell us earlier rather than waiting for the discharge diagnosis. And of course, we should also be looking at maybe there's a, a, a potential that some deaths could be associated with. We don't expect that to be the case, but we should be looking. So all of those sources of data come in and um, are fed into the system and we can look at them and collate them and make sense of it. So all of these are valuable components. At the moment, the most important one is the top left. That's the passive uh, system, which is what I'm going to be talking about now. Um, on the middle of the right hand side, um, there is a group called the Independent Safety Monitoring Board, which is a key component. And you can see there's MedSafe and the Medicine Adverse Reaction Committee. And not losing sight of the fact that we don't operate here in isolation from the rest of the world. We collaborate with our Australasian, with our Australian colleagues and international colleagues. Uh, and of course, we have uh, an increasing um, role with working with the Pacific Island uh, countries, nations. And that's a program that I'm also um, currently helping to get off the ground. They haven't started vaccinating in some of them, but we're trying to provide some support. So this is just a sense for you to get a feel of what else is going on, that it's not just about reporting to CAM, that there's a, a purpose and there's a, um, these things go into a broader system. So let's then move on and talk about this passive reporting. So the spontaneous or passive reporting at the moment, the focus for COVID-19 vaccines is through two main uh, portals. And the one is the COVID immunization register. And for those of you that are vaccinators in this program, I'm not sure all of you are, you will know that there's an adverse event reporting module within that program. And that's focused or intended to record events that occur in that 20 minute observation window. So look, I'm, I'm not saying that it has to be only in the 20 minutes, but it's whilst they're in the vaccination site. You know, if you choose to extend the, uh, the, the stay for a longer period, that's fine. It's, it's about what happens while they're still under observation or being observed. When they leave the site, then we encourage people to use are uh, a specifically designed COVID-19 online reporting form. And that's for events that occur outside. So it helps us to sort of distinguish where these things have occurred. Of course, we'll always be able to figure it out, but um, it's, it's helpful if they're used in that fashion. Both of these modules, both of these reporting uh, approaches have been standardized and we've used tick boxes to try and make it easy and make it rapid for you as reporters to tell us about these events. And that in its own right potentially can create a problem. Uh, people seem to think that it's probably easier just to write a whole narrative because the, the, the reporting form's got a series of tick boxes and there's an opportunity to explain in a free text field. And sometimes folks feel it's easier just to write the whole story in the, um, in the, narr in the narrative uh, area. Um, that's fine, but we've designed it to use tick boxes so that we can use those tick boxes to drive the data directly into a database. So if they are standard straightforward events that I'm sure all of you are aware of potential events after a vaccination, these are the arm pains and the headaches and the fevers and the myalgias and so on that we expect to get even the vasovagal events. Um, there's, we don't need to really go into those in a huge amount of detail. It's the unusual ones that we need to have more description around. So I really do encourage you to please, if there are tick boxes there and they're relevant to the event, 
please use them. We do have a, a, a box that says um, any other event that's not uh, listed in here, well, then that's where you uh, would be encouraged to use the, the narrative. And of course, use the narrative to explain something that's unusual about those events. So please use this because it does help us to um, deal with this data, particularly when there are big volumes of data coming through uh, in the system. And I'll speak a little bit about that a little bit later. Um, not forgetting that there is our traditional system uh, our online and the usual modalities that we've had in the past, but really I'm encouraging you and asking and imploring you for the COVID vaccine to uh, use the, uh, the modules that I've referred to rather than the calm um, traditional methods. Um, all this data, whether if it's a COVID vaccine that comes through the calm traditional, we still push it through uh, the system, but it's a bit more laborious. So we're, we're trying to use efficiencies and, and, and streamline processes. So just bear that in mind. So we hope this is easy. And um, if you do have issues and make observations around the use of the uh, forms and the, and the technology, please let us know. Um, the technology has been built by the ministry, so CARM has had input into these things, and it's a, it's a very new approach, um, and we need to learn from that. So um, we're very welcoming of um, any uh, feedback on that. Okay, so what happens to these reports that you send to us? So in the first instance, they get triaged. So if you tick the right boxes, um, then it helps us to filter out and focus on those reports that are really important. Um, you know, if, if we're only getting five or 10 reports a day, it's easy to look at all of them. But when we start rolling out this vaccine in big numbers, um, uh, you know, in tens of thousands a day, and potentially if everyone's sending us these reports, it may not be possible for us to look at all of those reports. So we need to look at them in some triage fashion. And so one of the triages is if you've identified the report to be serious. Now, in our pharmacovigilance world, globally, and that's for centers like ourselves in the pharmaceutical industry, there is an international definition of what is serious, and that may be different to your understanding of what is serious, but this is the general convention. And the general convention is that if the circumstances of the report or the event, I should say, result in hospitalization, or it was life-threatening, a death, and if you decide that it is medically significant from a clinical point of view, or it has persisting disability. And when I say persisting, or when we mean persisting disability here, we're saying that you've had the event and you've given it enough time to recover. For example, if you've had pain in the arm or swelling in the arm um, and you're sending us the report tomorrow morning uh, and you say, or two days later and it's still persisting, well, it's probably gonna recover in the next two or three days. Persisting disability is if that problem is still there uh, having uh, having had enough time to recover, so an event that's still occurring week, two weeks, three weeks later, and congenital abnormality. Look, we don't expect congenital abnormality to be part of um, an issue here. Who knows down the line? Maybe it could be, but that's officially what a serious report is. If it's none of those, then it's actually not serious, and people sometimes have difficulty understanding it. So we use that to filter. So if you've told us that this patient was hospitalized, and I should just stop for a moment there and say hospitalization actually means that they were admitted to hospital. So if they went to the ED, that's not necessarily hospitalization. Um, if they stay there for three or four hours, they don't actually get hospitalized. So we're looking at those that actually require a um, stay in, in hospital. So anyway, that helps us to triage the serious reports and we then go and look at those in a lot of detail. We've also identified a number of terms or tick boxes or events um, whether they're in tick boxes or in the narrative, or if you think that they're medically significant events that draw our attention to it. And I haven't listed them all here, but they're the sort of things like anaphylaxis, a, a significant neurological event, um, a convulsion, unexplained convulsion outside of a syncopal or vasovagal event, for example, now clotting events. And of course, all of those adverse events, especially just so we triage out, we try and identify, we do our best to try and identify through the system all these events that are important for us to look at and the rest, the, the sort of arm pains and the fevers and whatever that we expect to get with the vaccination, we'll record those, but we don't need to uh, focus too much attention on them. So when we look at those reports, we then also look at your narrative and read uh, what you've said to us and add any additional one, uh, events that may not have been tick box options, for example. We check for data consistency and we try and identify uh, as best we can, whether we think this is causally related. Um, and of course, most of them will be there. If we are 
hospital events or probably because they occur on the same day and they're the kind of thing that you expect to get after a vaccination. But just as an example, just this morning, I was looking at a report that was submitted um, of a, uh, was a consumer report, uh, patient uh, re uh, report, who had said that she got the vaccine um, a day or two ago um, and uh, the following day, her daughter had a fever and she thought that the fever could be due to the vaccine that the mother had received. So, you know, clearly in, under those circumstances, we wouldn't accept the, or believe that the vaccine was involved. So that's our sense of trying to make some sort of sense of causality. And that's a very obvious kind of one. And when we have, particularly for these serious reports, we will go back and potentially look for further information. If somebody is hospitalized, we don't have a lot of detail around it. We really do need to understand this because this could be important for the purposes of the program um, and the, the uh, continued use of the vaccine and understand that particular event. And this is where um, IMAC and in particular Jane has been really, really helpful with uh, Jane and, and, and her supporting colleagues um, to chase up information from the hospital or in those instances where I can't get back to the reporter. So it's important for us to get that information. And when we're looking through this, we're looking at the um, totality of the data to look at for, to look for those events that are of concern, those adverse events of special interest or ACs, um, which are the ones that are, are their patterns or the unexpected events or signals. And those events are the ones that we feed into the independent safety monitoring board. So this is a, a, a board which has been set up and as the first word says, it's independent. It's independent of the, of the ministry, of MedSafe, of um, the system basically. Um, and in a way, they, they potentially have the role, or they do have the role as a sort of a traffic light to say, look, we've, we're seeing an issue here that is of great concern and we need to stop the rollout. I mean, theoretically, that's the possibility that this board can advise to the program. But in, in, in practical reality, they're looking at those events that are unusual. We're looking at local data, we're looking at international data. Um, and the point of it is to identify those safety risks to the program and to MedSafe. And so some of that will come from what we see from these reports. So that's again, the importance of the data that you give us and the value of the data. And I have to say that the, the, traditionally over the years that I've been doing this for far too long here, and uh, all of you people who, who support us with vaccine reports, or well, medicines as well, of course, but you're pretty much all vaccinators, the quality of the data that you provide consistently has been outstanding and excellent. And I, I know that from global experience too, because I do some work for WHO in terms of reviewing global data and New Zealand stands out as having high quality data. So thank you for that and please continue to do that. So what are these adverse events of special interest, ACEs? So this comes out of um, a group called SPIAC and uh, SPIAC is part of CEPI. So all these words, so CEPI is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovations. And they've got a subgroup, which is part of the Brighton Collaboration. I'm sure you've heard of that. The subgroup is called SPIAC, which is the Safety Platform for Emergency Vaccines. Um, and they put up this uh, proposal here as to these are the events that we should be particularly interested in predicting in advance. We should be thinking about these kinds of events. And they've grouped them into three broad areas. And the one area is uh, adverse events that we might see with any kind of vaccine. And I'm sure those of you that have kept up, I mean, you see these anaphylaxis, we see that with vaccines, you know, get embryo, we've seen with influenza and so on. So these are all theoretically possible, but they're rare events anyway, um, but we should take note of them and we should follow them up. Then there's also adverse events that um, may relate to these unusual or new platforms um, that, that have been seen or there's theory around as to how they might um, be uh, implicated. And the third group uh, has got to do with uh, target disease, maybe related to COVID related um, uh, disease itself. Uh, and there's a whole group. So there's about 30 odd different um, uh, adverse events of special interest in here. Um, and, and all of these are of particular interest. So if we get a report with any of these things in there, those are the ones we particularly want to go and follow up and get more information around. And this is a dynamic list. It's not set in stone and it, it'll change over time um, as, as things go on. And you can see um, from the global um, interest that there's been recently in these plotting things that um, we, we see that under the hematologic in the third group on the right hand side, um, these uh, thrombotic events are of particular interest there. So let's have a look at anaphylaxis and hypersensitivity spectrum. Just moving on to some more specifics now. So 
we all know that anaphylaxis is a rare adverse event following immunization. I mean, typically the figure that's quoted is about one, possibly two per million doses of, a, of any vaccine, flu vaccine, for example. So it really is a truly rare event. And we're talking about properly diagnosed anaphylaxis and it becomes really important. And I'll be making this point as I move on from here about the importance for us to be sure that we are, are actually talking about anaphylaxis. So, we don't really have any, we don't have any reports of true anaphylaxis here in New Zealand yet. Thank you, thank goodness. Um, but let's have a look at what the global experience has been. And this is really the experience in the United States. So this was data that comes out of their um, uh, submission to the CDC um, from the, uh, at the bottom of this image there, the credit is the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. And this was data as of about the middle of January when they'd done across the two vaccines that they're using in the USA, which includes the Pfizer, about 18 million, 18, 19 million doses, they had um, these um, 71 cases across both, uh, both vaccines. And this is their, their sort of breakdown um, here. And this is reported to their VAERS program. Um, and VAERS is basically the equivalent of CALM, but it's the vaccine part of CALM. They've got an AIRS program and a VAERS program. The VAERS is the vaccine component of it. So, um, so they've seen in the first, I think it probably was about six or eight weeks at the time that they did this and, and, 20, and 18 million, 19 million doses, um, 71 events. So let's just understand a little bit more about these. Um, and this is their breakdown. Um, and you can see a lot of the details here that there's a uh, the younger age group, I guess that's got to do with who they, who they vaccinated. But um, draw your attention to the middle part of this, uh, that the, the onset is, is, is early onset within um, the first 30 minutes. Some of these people have had previous history of allergy, if you look there, for the Pfizer vaccine, which is one we're interested in, and similar sort of picture for the Moderna vaccine. About 80% of them had a previous uh, history of allergy, and some of them also had um, anaphylaxis with uh, other uh, things, and, and it occurs with, 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 both, with both doses. So there we are, and, and I think this, this is an interesting um, image um, and speaks to the importance of the uh, observation period. Now, you will remember that the observation period was, was initially 30 minutes and then it was reduced down to 20 minutes, uh, which is what it is now. And this is looking at those 71 cases across both vaccines, and you can see pretty much all of them, 90% of them presented in 30 minutes. Um, and uh, so, the, again, the importance of um, identifying these, uh, these events. So the question is, what is anaphylaxis? Look, I'm sure all of you are well aware of what anaphylaxis is. Um, and this is a, 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 an extract that I've taken out of a very useful manual that the WHO put out um, end of last year, very early this year. Uh, the title of it was at the bottom there, page 22 of this Immunization Stress-Related Responses Manual. And this very helpful table um, illustrates the difference on the spectrum between anaphylaxis on the left-hand side and vasovagal on the extreme right-hand side. And I'm sure most of you are really familiar, but often it does become difficult sometimes to tease out um, these events. So first of all, I'm not going to go through the whole uh, detail here, but if we just focus on the left-hand side, which is the anaphylaxis side of this, um, the important point is that if you look at the event, the skin, the respiratory, and uh, those sort of events, these are objective evidence of hypersensitivity. There's urticaria or hives, um, there's angioedema, there's um, rash that's present, um, uh, and the, the, they've got a noisy breathing, and they're, they're very obvious things that, that are happening. And anaphylaxis really is a combination of these things, not just a single event. On the extreme right, vasovagal, I'm sure you're all familiar with that, and I think the important parts or distinguishing vasovagal from things that are not necessarily um, vasovagal, but equally not necessarily anaphylaxis, is if you look under the general one here, which is these um, uh, acute general response, uh, stress responses, uh, this, this dizziness, numbness, tingling of the uh, lips and, and, and so on, and even the sort of tickling sensation in the throat, these are all subjective symptoms. And they are possibly related um, to um, um, Stress-related uh, responses, maybe the tingling is part of a, hy a hyperventilation with you know, calcium levels changing and so on. And really what we're interested in, in uh, distinguishing here is clearly is this anaphylaxis or have they got objective um, symptoms 
of hypersensitivity. And those are the important ones that we're interested in, they, uh, that, that, that we need to take particular attention of. Those subjective symptoms, we certainly need to, need to take attention of those. And maybe at the next dose, we should be watching out for those. And of course, the vasovagal ones are, um, are, are separate. And don't forget that it is possible with a vasovagal event that there could be a short-lived seizure. It's usually a couple of seconds and, and they can have transient sort of changes in, uh, in consciousness. So those are quite acceptable. So just to finish off now, uh, the question that I always get asked is what do you want reported to come? This is even before COVID. Um, and um, so, but the focus on the COVID environment, as I've indicated from the triage uh, section that I spoke about earlier, if it's a serious event, any of these events, the subcategories, you haven't put congenital abnormality, but of course you can put that in as well. If you consider it to be life-threatening, if the patient actually was hospitalized, medically significant, I mean, that's where you need to use your sense about this is this patient was unwell, it was seriously unwell, you were cl clinically concerned about this patient. And again, just to reinforce persisting disability, that really means we've given this event enough time to recover and they haven't, and they've still got a deficit. Um, and that's what we're looking at, of course, there. And clinically concerning, that's a bit like the medically significant, the same sort of idea. If it's unexpected or unusual, I mean, there are a whole bunch of events that we, we, we accept now in our stride that, look, this is the type of thing that will happen with the vaccine. Um, so, so tell us about that. And anything else, I mean, there's, it doesn't only have to be these, it could be other events. So this is just to try and help to focus your uh, attention. And then we're interested in error events. Um, and, and I'll come back to that in a second. So why, and, and when you're doing this, we, we ask you that for these events in particular, that you try and document them as fully as you possibly can. Clearly the anaphylaxis, if you think this is anaphylaxis, please manage the patient, sort the patients out, do whatever you need to. And when the dust is settled, um, tell us about that event. But please try and do it while it's still fresh in your mind. We, it's rare and we need to get the diagnosis absolutely uh, as close or as accurately as we can. So we need to have as much detail. We don't want to just ca capturing all those events that you think are, are, are anaphylaxis. We need, we, we need to be burrowed down. And we're looking to make uh, it easier to use the Brighton criteria. Some of you may be aware of the fact that Brighton has come up with a definition of what anaphylaxis is, and there's a whole lot of um, major and minor criteria. Uh, we don't want to confuse you with those, but we're looking to try and put together a possible checklist that you could use in the clinic, not for you to make the diagnosis, but for you to help us make the diagnosis by just saying, look, the patient had these tick box um, options. And so we're working on that and working out a way that it could be useful for you to do. And of course, when we're talking about serious and unexpected and unusual things, because they're so unusual, we want to try and understand as much as we can. So rather than just telling us um, telegraphically that this was unusual, um, we'll probably come back to you and ask for more, so maybe at the time. And error events, we're interested in those error events that actually reach the patient. And uh, we've been talking to Jane uh, about this. And of course, we know that IMAC and uh, your system are well versed in dealing with um, error events in terms of how the vaccine is uh, put together and the storage and the cold chain. And, and those are things that obviously the program uh, is well versed in, in dealing with. But when, when an event actually reaches the patient, if the vaccine was administered too high or uh, it was incorrectly diluted and it actually was given to the patient. Those are the ones that we're particularly interested in. And when we collect that, it's not just the fact that it's occurred. We're also looking at what are the contributing factors. And so if you can help us with that too, that would be helpful. So I'm going to stop at this point and um, thank you again for listening. And um, I hope that's been useful for you and um, open it up to any particular questions there might be. So I'll stop sharing this at this point and hand over to Jane. Thank you, Michael. That was very interesting. <laughs> I'm sure everybody found it helpful. And I am also sure that the people that listen to it later will find it um, informative. I'm looking to see whether anyone's got any questions. Now's your opportunity to type questions in. At the moment, we've got one question about CIR, which is the, um, the COVID immunization register. I'm just wondering if any of the other panelists that are on are aware of whether there's a specific section to upload clinical notes. Um, I don't know if any of you want to talk to that. I know you can scan the consent form in, and we did leave some space on the consent form on the back of that for people to be able to scan it in, uh, for people to be able to record things.
the question was asked, Michael, whether people leave, um, if they leave before the 20 minutes is up, would that be recorded? And I was saying, well, no, if there's no particular concern and they've chosen not to wait, that's not a, an issue, um, but yeah. it's useful to record that. Well, I, I guess for the system's perspective, it, it, it is. Yeah, um, I meant from the system's point of view, yeah. not from CALM's point of view. Correct. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? I was envisaging we'd have lots of questions coming through, but uh, maybe you've covered everything as we've as you've talked through, which is always um, good. Right. Well, I'll still give people a few more minutes. If there aren't any questions, then we can um, call it a day and uh, wish everybody the best. I'm sure we've all got lots of uh, work to be getting on with, but it is an opportunity to specifically ask Michael questions. And uh, Got a comment here saying thank you for the information and have any of us had the covid vaccine yet i think yes i think most well probably about 50 percent of our team have as um support um those that are working directly in the covid vaccine centers um have been vaccinated and i expect you saw nikki turner having hers on the telly as a um, gp um and now we've got did you publish data data early um the data that you've got goes through to MedSafe and then they choose when they publish it, doesn't it, Michael? Yes, uh, just, just to clarify that, because a lot of people have asked us, what, are the, what is the data relating to what we've seen um, to date? Um, so the, to try and keep things focused in the system, the uh, system works on the basis that the data all go goes to MedSafe and MedSafe then uh, has the uh, overview of what the data is and, and puts the data right, because we run the risk of you know, Michael at Calm has said this with MedSafe has got a different figure because of the dynamics of where we are in terms of the real time of reporting. Uh, yeah, and those is always a bit important. delayed, isn't it? So, so the ministry is the place to, uh, to, to manage the data. And as Jane showed earlier on, um, it is a bit out of date, but they will, they've apparently got a system in place now that will be updated very regularly. So it'll, it'll, it'll all come from the common source. There's a question here saying that amongst staff, there are concerns that the vaccine will make them unwell and they may need to take sick leave. I'm wondering what our thoughts are about that. Um, perhaps just to comment from the observations that I've um, seen from the reports that have come in, there have been people that have been um, unwell who have needed to be off work for a day or two or three, even in some instances. Um, I don't know how the system deals with that, but um, that, that is the case. And perhaps just, just, just one sort of general comment about what I've seen with the reports that have, uh, that have come in that, that I've reviewed, and I've pretty much seen all of the um, adverse event reports that have come in, in fact, I have seen all of them, um, is that the events are, again, consistent with what um, we've seen uh, globally, uh, no, nothing that stands out. Um, we do know that this vaccine is slightly more reactogenic than, say, the flu vaccine, for example. So the, the events are a bit more severe, and, and um, but, but not not incapacitating. Um, and again, just in terms of that severity, some of these events do seem to persist for uh, a bit longer than you might ordinarily expect with the headache and the myalgia and so on. And then uh, and again, coming back to the question here, some of them have been to the point where people have, have felt. Um, uh, unwell to the point that they haven't been able to go back to it. But those are really, you know, handfuls of, of numbers given the sort of scale of what we've done so far. Jane, well, I think you have... Comment, you like? yeah. Please do, Emma. Sorry. So, hi, I'm, I'm just dialing in as one of the panellists. Some of you may know me as a, one of the IMAC medical advisors and a paediatrician infectious disease specialist as well. So at our DHB, we are rolling out the second vaccine now. Um, but actually, the Australian real-time data is quite interesting, isn't it, Michael, that they're showing that around 1% of people are needing after their second dose to see a doctor on the next day. So I think it, it is, as you said, exactly what Michael said, it is a more reactogenic vaccine. You know, uh, a small proportion of people, lots of people might feel not well, and a small proportion are needing to even see a doctor because they've got a fever or the myalgias of that to that level. So I do think it is important in workforce planning to think about when the second dose is going to happen. But... Um, lots of DHBs and things are addressing that right now with their healthcare worker um, two-dose vaccine rollout at the moment. Thank you, Emma. Appreciate it. Um, and there's a question here saying, is there plans for New Zealand to have active monitoring of safety through um, medical records? 
you did touch on the um, idea of us having active surveillance, didn't you? And, the, and that Nikki is already trialing it in her practice. Yeah, that's that's as far as we've got at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, and and that that trial is really part of an HRC grant that we've got going, and we're and we're hoping to demonstrate the proof of concept and and therefore encourage the the, the, um, the immunisation program at large to um, invest in this, take it further. So yeah, hopefully that does happen. Okay. Well, there's a comment here from somebody who says a colleague of theirs in the USA had a, an unusual reaction after a vaccine that he thought might have been related, uh, retinal vein occlusion a week after his second dose, um, and wanted us to make sure that um, people were aware of this type of thing. And I think that fits really with the unusual conditions that you were saying you want reported just in case we do find a link um, balanced Absolutely. against what happens I mean, that... naturally. That's exactly right. And, and again, that comes back to the point about unexpected, unusual things that you're concerned about. Tell us about it. I mean, it may not be that this is related, but the point is, unless we have it in the database, unless we have an ability to follow it up and, and try and make some sense of it, we may not have the answer, but at least let's collect that data to, to start. Okay, I think. Oh, and we've got a couple more coming in here now. I thought it might get busy. I was surprised it was quiet to start with. And is there any feedback to the patients about the um, how you've reviewed their case? I mean, obviously you can't feed back to all of them, but uh, those that are more serious, where we're yeah, thinking about. Yeah, yeah, Jane. Um, so, so that that is a limitation that we were at the moment, just with the volumes that are coming through at the moment, and trying to keep up with our usual calm work. It's not been possible to respond back to those patients that put a report or report it, whether they're patients or healthcare professionals. To respond back to them in the same way that we have in the past is just is just been out of um, out of our ability. Um, I have responded to telephone calls where, where people have, have called and we've and we've had a discussion, but the, just the logistics at the moment of doing that it, it is a bit unfortunate. Mm. Um, somebody's saying if somebody feels unwell enough to need to take time off work, should they report it to Calm? And I think that's a definite one that yes, they would be reporting it, wouldn't they? Yes, because I'm presuming that that event is of a, a sufficiently significant nature. And we're interested in our reporting um, forms to try and get a sense of just how long were people unwell for. And in fact, one of the questions that we asked on our version of the form before the ministry took it over was, um, did it result in time off work? Because I think that would be some very interesting data for us to be able to get that if it's possible to get it easily. That's quite a good question here. How good is the background data on incidents in New Zealand to determine whether rare side effects could be explained by coincidence rather than being causal? Well, well we do have um, data based on uh, hospital admissions or discharges. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, Helen Patusas Harris is involved in a, pro in a program, a, a, a project of determining what the background rate uh, for these events are and part of that study is actually validating whether uh, the ICD codes that are assigned to those rare events are in fact valid. We think that they are but we need to establish that first of all and then that we used as the background level um, uh, to get that data. Um, so yes we, we, we can go back and look at it but it's as good as we get but, but we think it's robust. It's been used in a number of other approaches and studies here in New Zealand as well so it's not a new uh, modality. Okay, and then there's uh, one last question at the moment, which says, have we seen any, or have you seen any lymphedema or gland swelling in the CALM reports? So yes, there have been, I can't tell you what the number is because I, I don't really have that really access to it, but there, but there have been a few that have um, had axillary lymphadenopathy or cervical lymphadenopathy on the side where they've had the, vac uh, the vaccine administered. And of course we would expect that as part of the regional response with the lymph nodes in that area starting the immune response. Lovely. Right. Well, last chance. If anybody that's uh, listening has got any last questions you want to ask, I think we've got through quite a few already. Um, and we're nicely within time because it's just um, coming up to 10 to 1. So we've had plenty of time to go through everything and plenty of opportunity for people to ask questions. So I think then it just remains for me to thank you, Michael, so much for coming to join us and sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. Um, and also to thank Emma Best, our um, medical advisor, for joining us. Um, towards the end of the session, which is why I didn't introduce her at the beginning. And all our panelists tucked away in the background helping to respond to questions. So this webinar will be available for people to listen to at a later stage if they want to. Um, 
And just one last question popped up now before we say final goodbye. Is there any advice to tell a radiographer if they have vaccines before mam mammography due to adenopathy? This is why um, Emma's just left us. <laughs> we have got some guidance on this on our Q&A section on our website. Um, and yes, there is there can be um, some slight changes following um, COVID vaccine. And so if they're picked up, it might be COVID vaccine related. Is that your are you in, have you been involved in those discussions, Michael? No, I haven't, but I'm I'm aware of those discussions. I've been sort of copied mm -hmm. in them, but I haven't been directly involved. But yes, there, there is a clear or reasonably clear guidance on that. Yeah, so as I say, it's on our, our Q&A page um, to get more information on that. And basically, we're not advising people not to have mammography. Um, it, routine mammography is important, and certainly we wouldn't want people to be delaying it. But the people that are doing the scanning, the radiographers need to be aware that, you know, if they're picking up changes and somebody has recently had a COVID vaccine, it might have something to do with that. And so that's what our information is about. Right. Okay. Great. Well, thank, thank you for you having me, much. and I look forward to interacting with you all in some way or another, as we have in the past. Um, yep. Thank you very much. I'm just reading one last question that came through that somebody's uh, put in, which said, um, "What? Oh, no. It's right. We've covered it already. That's fine. So, thank you. We'll call it a day then, right. and let everybody get to lunch. Bye bye. Bye bye.